Tonight, it's time to round up your friends, because you're about to get your first chance to see some of Britain's first ever films. You'll laugh with the men who could have been Laurel and Hardy. You'll cry with the girl who could have been the original Orphan Annie. And you'll despair at the tragic fate of the man who should have become cinema's greatest ever tramp. But you'll rejoice in the exploits of Britain's long-forgotten first pioneer film family. The family responsible for some of cinema's earliest and most startling innovations. And through it all, you'll delight in the tale of the small Yorkshire mill town that should have become the movie capital of the world. Prepare yourself for Home Firth Hollywood. The great appeal of early film is the fact that we know nothing, or next to nothing. Many of the films are, have been lost. We know very little about how the business operated. We know next to nothing about what audiences thought of these films. And in that we are akin to those at the time. They didn't really know what business they were stepping into. This giant speculation, will this work? Will that work? And what's fascinating about early cinema is this cloud of unknowing, which is both frustrating and both part, uh, part of the great fascination about it. This is Hollywood in its filmmaking infancy. What you're about to find out is how all this hectic activity nearly happened somewhere else. How the movie capital of the world could have ended up somewhere 5,298 miles to the east. This is Homeforth a small town in the Pennine Valley of West Yorkshire with a population of 25,000. But once upon a time, this was a place where every man, woman and child had the chance to become a film star. Because Home Firth was almost the first Hollywood. In 1890, Home Firth was a small but busy place, famous for its textile mills, strongly religious town folk and its kick-ass brass band. These pictures don't actually come from 1890. They come from 30 years later, because in 1890, the movie camera hadn't been invented. But it was here, in the town you can just about see in the background, in the 1890s, that our story begins. With a local businessman, Mr. James Bamforth. Would you please introduce yourself? I was born in 1842, and my name is Mr. James Bamforth, Victorian film pioneer. It all began when I joined the family business. Whilst working as a painter and decorator, I discovered I had a particularly good artistic bent. Now, in those days, painting and decorating had more art artistic merit than today. And he was a brilliant artist, and he had this hobby of photography when it first came out. And he obviously decided to use his talents in a different form. In what direction did the use of these talents take you? I realised I had A, the skill to paint an enormous backdrop with uncanny realism. B, the ability to manipulate models until you could practically feel their anguish, and see the technical wizardry to capture this vision photographically. Together, these skills soon made me the king of the magic lantern slide. In the late 19th century, for those ladies and gentlemen who lived outside of the biggest towns, but were in search of a top time, the biggest entertainment event of the season was the Magic Lantern Show. It looked something like this. And that was it. A story told by a set of slides as some fellow sang along. From his studio in Homeforth, Mr. Bamforth set out to dominate this business of telling stories on the big screen. 
early productions were somewhat crude, but through the 1880s they became more sophisticated and he specialised in what were known as life model studies. Um, revolutionary that um, what he used were models who would dress up in costume and against backdrops they would reenact narrative stories, often morally uplifting in tone. And by the late 1880s he was advertised as one of the world's biggest producers of these, um, of these lantern slides. Here is one of Mr Bamforth's most popular lantern slide stories called Billy's Rose. Billy is lying on his deathbed when his sister promises to fetch him a rose. Out in the snow, she prays for the aforementioned rose and, as if by magic, it appears at her feet. It has been thrown there by a grande dame in a fit of pique. Billy's sister is delighted, but before she can give Billy's rose to Billy, Billy drops dead. Overcome by the storm, Billy's sister also drops dead. But that's okay. Because it means she gets to give Billy his rose in the kingdom of heaven. Mr. Bamforth was so good at making these lantern slide stories that he was soon rattling them out. I might compare him perhaps with Rolf Harris. The backdrops were produced so quickly. He could do wonderful mountain scenery, he could do anything that was required, and uh, a lot of the slides were involved with, for instance, the evils of drink. Here's a chap coming out of the pub at closing time. I remember they had a whole collection which showed the whole story of a family starving to death because the husband couldn't stop drinking. Mr. Bamforth's morality slideshows were a roaring success. To the future. The future. He was perfectly positioned to take advantage of the advent of cinema. He had the actors and the sets. He knew the stories the public wanted. The only thing he didn't have was a camera. Father, father, look what I've purchased. What is it, son? It's a cinematograph, one of the first in the country. That's right, I'd forgotten. The cinematograph was invented by the Frenchman Louis Lumiere in 1895 from an idea based on Edison's kinetoscope. Following Mr. Lumiere's magnificent invention, the world and its dog jumped on his bandwagon. If you look at the journals of the, the late 1890s, what you'll find is the pages are full of new bits of equipment with wonderful names, chiroscope, kineoptoscope, and so on, uh, every scope that you can imagine. And you do get a picture that all over the country there are small manufacturers, pioneers, working away, come up with their own versions of machines, which they can then advertise as, this gives you the best picture, this gives you the best performance, and so on. As soon as the moving picture was invented, then my grandfather was in on it because he realized that, of course, this would supersede the, the um, mantle slides. It was still very much a novelty, so he was in there right at the start. He saw the potential for this new medium, but also I think he saw the possible financial benefits. So he was prepared to dip his toe in the water and, and see what happened. Happily following on from the invention of the moving picture camera was the invention of the projector. This opened up the possibility of charging people to see whatever you managed to film. All you needed was to get people to their local cinema. In the 1890s when films first appeared, people didn't go to the cinema because there were no cinemas. So films were shown in theatres, music halls, town halls, Salvation Army halls, in fairgrounds and so forth. And they will be part of the show. Man says to his wife, Mr. Darwin says we're descendants of apes. Wife says to man, darling, surely that can't be true. But if it is, let's pray that it's not generally known. <laughs> so you might see a singer, some magic lantern slides, a comedian, and then the bioscope will turn up and you'll probably have 25 minutes worth of, of these little one minute films. <laughs> For the early film pioneers, everything was now falling into place, not least of which was the arrival of the audience. The late Victorian, early Edwardian period was a period of great economic boom. People were wealthier than they were before, factory conditions were better, and they also had the Saturday afternoon off. I mean, if it wasn't for the Saturday afternoon off, we wouldn't just have not had cinema, we wouldn't have had football or any sporting event. It's all tied into the fact people had the Saturday afternoon off. 
In 1899, nothing at all was happening in Hollywood. But in Yorkshire, an eager audience was seated, although technically speaking they had to stand, and awaiting James Bamforth's filmic debut. Over the subsequent century, most of the exhibition records have been lost. But on a Saturday, sometime in 1899, probably at a fairground near Homeforth, with some sort of musical accompaniment, James Bamforth, film pioneer, finally showed his very first film. And it very well might have been this very one. <laughs> This epic film is called Men Leaving the Factory. It features men leaving the factory and lasts a full one minute and nine seconds. Wherever people saw films all over the world, the first time they saw a moving picture on the screen, they could hardly believe their eyes. Suddenly to see transport, horses and carts, people, and that was enough actually. I mean, the filmmakers didn't have to be too clever to start with. Basically just set the camera up on the street corner, shoot some film, and people would pay to go and see it. They are most easily read as a photograph, which just happens to move, but there was this uh, exhilaration seeing motion and you get these memories of film producers of the time so that they could show practically anything on the screen and an audience would be overwhelmed by the, by the experience. Mr James Bamforth's early actuality films were a triumph. So popular they were shown until they wore out. But amongst the few to have survived is Leapfrog. Leapfrog shows local boys playing leapfrog in a manner that, to modern eyes, may seem rather reckless. And for the folks of Homefirth, 55 miles from the coast, he made this. Rough Sea is a one-minute film showing a rough sea. For the majority of his audience, this may have been their first glimpse of the mighty ocean. But the documentary genre was wearing thin on our Victorian film pioneer. He had a plan. With his Magic Lantern experience of making highly complicated, melodramatic and narrative-driven drama with a religious and anti-drinking twist, he made the obvious decision and decided to take his filmmaking in a new direction. I know. I'm going to make a comedy. James Bamforth, film pioneer, and his merry band of Magic Lantern actors took to the streets of Homeforth and the parks and began to produce a series of one-shot, one-minute comedy films. Bamforth have come from that almost unique industry of the life model lantern slide but they understood about storytelling on the screen and it seems natural that they would have looked at the new moving picture equipment and thought well we can expand what we're doing and it's the new thing and the new thing was very important in late victorian england whether it was x-rays you know whether it was moving pictures or whatever people wanted to see the new thing in the late 1890s the big new thing was the comedy short for many British citizens, their first taste of it came from little old Homeforth and James Bamforth's one-minute work, Weary Willie. Enjoy. Weary Willie is one of cinema's first tramp figures. Here he spies an occupied park bench and seeks to drive off those occupants with his objectionable behaviour. To modernise, then, um, we are used, obviously, to a much longer narrative structure, so we often feel that um, they are so short. But what they do is they have a very simple storyline, and it gives you what you expect. So in that sense, they are, they are perfect little gems of films, given the fact that people are still very much experimenting with what you can actually do with the medium. It's really difficult to judge the very early films, the films of the 1890s. It's really difficult to recognise what it was the audiences got from them. We only have a strip of film with some images on. We don't have the ambience, we don't have the current political jokes, we don't have 
the explainer by the side of the screen, maybe making up different stories, perhaps stories the filmmaker didn't even think of. We don't have the music, we don't have the sense of occasion. What we have is this piece of film, and we have to try to recreate or to imagine what that must have been. We know relatively little about audience reaction in early film shows. There seems to be common perception or conception that people would shout out things or talk or, or make quite a lot of noise and react to what was going on, on the screen. <gasps> Actually, we're not really sure if this happened or not. What we do know is that whatever they'd been up to during the film, by the time it had finished, the audience was gagging for more. <laughs> and James Bamforth, film pioneer, was happy to oblige. <laughs> Here's another of his early masterpieces called The Tramp and the Baby's Bottle. A passing policeman is so struck by a childminder's beauty that he's forced to do an about turn and passionately take her by surprise. As is often the case, one thing leads to another and the randy policeman manages to persuade the innocent childminder to join him for a brief sojourn in the bushes. However, disaster strikes when this gives an opportunistic tramp the chance to steal the baby's bottle. What's interesting about the Bamford films in the context of the company, they started as a magic lantern company, they started making the most holy than vow temperance plays about little Jim going to heaven and the, and the pearls of drink and the pearls of prostitution, everything like that. And suddenly, when they started making these films, they tapped into another source of this kind of northern humour. I mean, you, you watch a Bamford film and you can see Benny Hill. It is rather surprising because he obviously was quite a serious man. But the fact is that he realised that to amuse the public, this was the, uh, the source of the whole thing. And for top public amusement, here Mr Bamforth provides yet another film of a titillating nature. This time, it's the tale of a wronged husband who gets revenge on his wife's paramour by craftily substituting himself for her when an inopportune sneeze provides him with the opportunity. I think I'm right in saying that he was the first to start up using live actors in slapdash comedy. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was even before Hollywood when they were first done. Technically speaking, the term is slapstick, not slapdash, but young Mr Bamforth is right. His grandfather was making these films eight years before anyone had ever heard of Hollywood. Hollywood? What's Hollywood? His decision to concentrate on comedy was a wise one. It's a mistake to look at the film production of very early years and think of it in terms of what it became later. They weren't just rushing out into the garden and making, uh, making funny comedies uh, and, hey presto, somebody might like it. It's a business, first and foremost. Nobody went into it for the love of it. They were there to make money. I mean, the good thing you have to bear in mind about film at this stage is how international it was. Of course, silent film doesn't have the barriers of, of language. So films that were made in Paris or in Homeforth or in New York could be viewed and enjoyed by audiences all over the world. Bamforths did actually continue to make the occasional local actuality film, such as Queensbury Tunnel, where new excitement is brought to the ever-popular train-on-a-track genre with the addition of a second train. Homeforth and its neighbouring beauty spots were now featuring in some of Britain's most advanced films, as Mr Bamforth became a man of unparalleled invention. Father, have you ever thought some of our films were a bit boring? Yes, son, but I have a plan. In our Magic Lantern slideshow, we change location during the stories. If we were to do the same with our films, we'd move the business onto a whole new level. Let's invent the edits! In 1899, James Bamforth released the groundbreaking film A Kiss in the Tunnel. This is it. A steam train pulling six carriages hurtles towards a tunnel. All of a sudden, there's an edit. And the viewer is catapulted to the inside of the train, 
where a gentleman enjoys a quick puff as a lady reads the paper. Then, taking advantage of the darkness of the tunnel, he moves across and has his way with his fellow passenger. But, just as things are getting interesting, we are abruptly catapulted back outside of the tunnel as the train emerges. Now, rather strangely, the train has grown and is now pulling eight carriages. This might not be relevant. In Bamford's early film, Kiss in the Tunnel, we get a real first for cinema. We get uh, a cut which is used to express continuity, but with a continuing narrative. This was an absolute first, not only in this country, but in the world. You've got train moving into tunnel, then an established piece with two actors, and then train moving out of tunnel. This is exactly how you might have done it with Magic Lantern slides, only with still images. And this technique was then used fairly extensively from then on. With Kiss in the Tunnel, Mr. James Bamforth of Homeforth helped move film to the next level. There was the early train carriage continuity error. There was that groundbreaking edit. Here it is again. And there was something else. The carriage contains another secret, one that very well might have inspired the biggest name in film history. My father was involved because he was um, in the firm. He was kissing that beautiful girl. <laughs> I think, uh, rather like Hitchcock, uh, he was always he poked his nose in films, didn't he? An interesting analogy, although not entirely correct. After all, Hitchcock put himself in his films and not his son. If indeed uh, a son he had. Actors, come in. But the Bamforths were the world's very first filmmaking dynasty. Seeing it was his idea, James got to be the director. As well as Edwin providing the lips, other son Frank was behind the camera and another son, Harry, would later run the American operation. Daughter Janie was in charge of wardrobe and had also starred in numerous films, including playing the childminder who got led astray. Of course, the idea of keeping it in the family had the great benefit of cutting down on cost and often members of your family would be prepared to do things more flexibly than having to, um, to pay people. And... Finish! Crikey. Father, all this kissing's making my lips chapped. Can we get someone else to do all the hard work? Yes, son. I have another plan that'll save us all a lot of hard work. Go and get Harry Calvert. My maternal grandfather, Harry Calvert, told me of an occasion when some men came to the school he was at and asked the head teacher if they could borrow a few of the bigger boys for a half day. My grandfather, of course, was delighted to be given the opportunity to have off school, and they were taken to Homeside Farm. There was snow on the ground, and they had to hide behind a wall and then throw snowballs at the local squire, who was coming down the drive in Pony and Trap. My grandfather made the point that this meant he was an early movie star. Thanks to Bamforth's distribution efficiency, this film of Harry Calvert and his friends may have been seen as far afield as New York and Moscow. It wasn't long before the whole town was fighting for the chance of worldwide fame. In another film featuring children and made long before the days of televised replays, a disagreement during a cricket match turns rather nasty. The whole of Home Firth uh, thought it was great fun. They all came into it and um, the extras were absolutely free. <laughs> but of course, being a new thing, they were very proud of the fact that they were involved. I do remember, for instance, the local station master they used to allow trains to go backwards and forwards with the normal people in, and if the scene was shot incorrectly, then the train went back again and they came back into the station. I guess for down-to-earth northern folks, it must have seemed a, a, a bit of a, a bit of silliness, silliness really. I, I wonder how surprised they actually were that the whole thing became such a major part of, of 20th century culture. I, I think they 
may well have dismissed it as a, as a bit of silliness at the time. But as all the folks of Holmfirth got their chance to strut their stuff, it was inevitable that some would truly grab the limelight. One of these stars features in The Would-Be Conjurer. In this one-minute film, a country yokel visits a magic show and has coins pulled from his nose. When he returns home, he tries the same trick on his wife. It stars Fred Bullock. His profession was as a blacksmith in Ormfirth, and he would be called on by Messrs Bamforths to go in as an extra. But it doesn't surprise me because he's quite a jovial sort of person. That's Fred. Fred on the left there, having his nose pulled. When the headscarf comes off, you can see it's a man. It's rather embarrassing, I suppose, one would say, to see one's gra grandfather dressed up in drag as a woman. Why do uh, men dress as women as, as these films? Um, because it's funny. It's, st it, it, <laughs> it's still funny now. Look at Little Britain. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything that's simpler than that. I think there's a certain amount of decorum that wasn't necessarily appropriate that women be taking part in knockabout dramas, but chiefly the British have always laughed at men dressed as women and always will. Do you know, Father, I think that Fred Bullock's rather good. You're right, son. I've a good mind to use him in our most groundbreaking production yet. I've developed a new technique that I think will really blow people's minds. This new technique first appeared in a film starring Fred Bullock. Made in 1899, this is it. For many years we didn't know what the title of the film was and it was given the rather prosaic title of Ladies' Skirts Nailed to Fence, which is what you see. What is extraordinary from a cinematic sense is that you're seeing one action from different points of view, showing how the camera can be in more than one place at once. A radical innovation, but also it's just a cheap gag about two, 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 <coughs> two women being, being, being nailed to a fence. Careful examination reveals James Bamforth didn't achieve this remarkable effect of the camera appearing to be in two places at once by simply moving the camera. Instead, he left the camera where it was and told the actors to go around the other side of the fence. Ingenious. But all this innovation was for more than just a cheap gag. It wasn't until the late 1990s that someone discovered that this was actually based on a Bamforth lantern slide sequence called Women's Rights and that there was a little narrative that went along with it. The husband of one of the wives is upset with the suffragette issue and nails his wife and uh, her friends' skirts to the fence as some form of punishment. Suddenly, here's a film full of social interest. All comedy has elements of social history in it because every single joke is encoded with attitudes and opinions about how things are in the world, that it's okay in certain eras for a man and woman to be physically fighting. So the point of these films really is to document those social attitudes and opinions, what people find funny, but what they're also laughing about, what are the issues that, is, that are okay to laugh at, such as the mocking of the suffragettes. If you were mocking contemporary feminism, for example, in comedy, you'd, you'd get short shrift, really. But it was okay then to mock women's struggle for suffrage because they were seen as a threat and those threats can be kind of put down with humour. By the beginning of the 20th century, Holmfirth was one of Britain's leading film centres, and that made Bamforths one of the leading film companies in the world. But in 1902, after two years of being at the cutting edge of this brand new medium, James Bamforth was faced with a momentously momentous decision. Son, we've got to streamline this business of ours. Do we concentrate on A, films, which quite probably will turn out to be the most important entertainment medium of the 20th century, making film producers million upon million upon million, or B, postcards? I reckon postcards, Father. A wise choice, son. A wise choice. It's, well, it's one of the great... It's one of the great mysteries. <laughs> there are greater mysteries out there. 
It's something of a mystery why Banffor stopped making the film uh, when it did. We don't have business records, but we're fairly sure that the filmmaking side of them was a relatively small part of their business. And they probably weren't making that much money. But in the early 1900s, the postcard business takes off in a huge way. And that's what Bam Banforth uh, moves into. And it sets the films aside. Well, the postcards originally were reproduced from my grandfather's lantern slides. They were the, portraying the ballads of the day, the um, sentiments, etc., etc. They went like a bomb. They were just what the public wanted. And um, it was big business. It's quite interesting that most of the film pioneers, great names like Lumiere and Paul, didn't remain in the industry. Once the industry got established with a, quite a big financial infrastructure, this is where the pioneers start to duck out. Of the Bamforth family's early adventures in motion pictures, only 13 films are known to still exist. They're now housed in carefully controlled conditions at the British Film Institute to prevent the nitrate-based film from spontaneously combusting. But Bamforth's film career had come to a halt. The Bamforth films are an absolutely crucial survival from the earliest days of cinema. It's one of the most important early film companies. And even more significantly, they're from outside the southeast of England, so they're very rare indeed, and as such, uh, extremely precious to us. And that should have been that. For the next decade, it seemed that Homefirth would indeed return to being a quiet mill town, albeit one with a thriving postcard business. The Bamforths and Homeforths filmic escapades would eventually be forgotten. A fate that seemed sealed when James Bamforth, Victorian film pioneer, sadly passed away, aged 69, in 1911. Little did he know that only one year later, his own family's film business would rise from the dead and once more set out to turn Homeforth into Hollywood. That's right. There I was, still warm in the grave, and Edwin, who had talked me out of filmmaking, decides to go back into filmmaking. What was he thinking of? I don't think it's surprising that anyone goes back into filmmaking in 1912 because by the end of the Edwardian decade, film is definitely the most dominant cultural form of entertainment. So they probably felt that they'd missed their opportunity and they were going back into it. For the young Mr. Edwin Bamforth, it may have actually been an opportunity too difficult to overlook. Hollywood had now entered the filmmaking business with gusto, but more importantly, following a number of tragedies when films caught fire, concerns over public safety led to the invention of the cinema. And by 1912, even little old Homeforth itself had a massive purpose-built movie theater smack bang in the town center. Bamforth left film production for a dozen years or so. When they came back to filmmaking, the film business had changed utterly. Film production was now major business worldwide, and there were cinemas in every town, practically every street throughout the country. And these cinemas had to be filled with something. Of course, when they came back into filmmaking, cinema had moved on tremendously. The way that people saw films had changed, and of course, the nature of the films themselves, much longer, much more sophisticated. So it wasn't a case of picking up where they left off. They had to come back and basically relearn um, and reinvent themselves within cinema. So, sister, we are filmmakers again. Guess so. So what do we do now, then? I don't know. Every film company, practically of that period, had its comedian. Obviously, the, the Keystone Company had Charlie Chaplin from 1914 onwards, but there was Cretinetti in Italy, Fred Evans, or Pimple, in, 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 in Britain. There was Max Linder in France, and Banforth, I, I think, said, right, we can slot in with that. I've heard that every film company has its own comedian. I've heard that too. Let's get one. Film had now entered a new professional era, and the good people of Homeforth well, they were now no longer deemed worthy of a place in the spotlight. Next. The challenge for an up-and-coming film company was to 
spot the man whose comic skills could move seamlessly from the stage to the silver screen. Next. Next. Bamforth's settled on the man with the killer comic wink. He went by the name of Winky. The oldest known Winky film still in existence was made in 1914. It's called Winky Causes a Panic. Enjoy. Winky Causes a Panic is a comic caper in which Winky plays a tramp who happens upon a bear suit. Winky uses the bear suit to cause mayhem throughout the town. All for the rather cunning purpose, and you find out at the end of this two-minute epic, of getting himself some free booze. Well, I think they're very funny. Obviously, they're not as sophisticated as humour today, but um, they're rather like the old Harold Lloyd things in Hollywood. Winky is not a particularly sophisticated comedian, but he's, he's good enough. You could see why Bamforths had chosen him to star in the comedies, and he was clearly very popular. He's not a typical British comic. He's much more like an Italian or French performer, apart from winking. And there are several emblematic shots at the end of the films where you get a close-up of him winking his eye. What we don't know is where he came from, what he was doing before, to suddenly start making a series of comic films in the tradition of European comic is unusual. Despite being out of the business for more than a decade, Bangforth still knew what tickled the British public's fancy. Winky was an overnight sensation, and the sequels came thick and fast. This is Winky's Ruse, another Winky film from 1914. Here the addition of title cards enables far more ingenious plotting, although Winky is still playing a tramp after free booze. Well, Winky's Ruse is particularly interesting. I think it's the seventh Winky film, and uh, probably of the earlier ones to survive. Possibly the best. It's simple, uh, but it makes sense. Yes, indeed. And what sense it is. After Winky's initial tea wine switcheroo success, the crafty landlord seeks to foil any further trickery by swapping the wine for the painkiller laudanum. But as Winky and his tramp buddy have overheard this plan, Winky can catch the landlord out with much ensuing hilarity. In the same year that Charlie Chaplin first began wearing his tramp costume on screen, this rival Yorkshire scallywag was already on his seventh misadventure. The tramp figure represents the little man, the down and out, and Charlie Chaplin called his character the little man. And being English, Chaplin knew that the English audiences will side with the underdog. So we'll always like characters like Winky because they're up against it. And in a kind of weird way, they're free to do whatever they want. And they look like distressed aristocrats that they tend to wear three-piece suits and uh, damaged white shirts. So it's a kind of mocking of, of upper-class styles as well. And we like that in England. That, that's a very English thing to mock the upper classes and side with the underdog. Winky's ruse is so on Winky's side that he escapes unpunished from his crime. A crime that actually allows him and his fellow tramp to leave their old lives behind via Homeforth Station. With Winky's success, Homeforth and the surrounding countryside became a flurry of filming, and soon this tiny mill town was producing one five-minute drama every week. Understandably, with such speedy turnaround, plotting wasn't always paramount. Or, for that matter, universal. This is Winky and the Dwarf, also from 1914. Here, Winky's hungry tramp attempts to steal some picnickers' picnic by disguising a sleeping tramp as a dwarf. This he does by digging a hole, inserting the tramp's lower legs into said hole, and then balancing his shoes on his knees. Winky then persuades a passing lad to lure the picnickers away from their picnic with the promise of seeing a dwarf. I think one looks at the Winky films and realises that the past is a foreign country. <laughs> they do things very differently there. 
I don't get it. <laughs> uh, it does seem to me that the crudest and uh, most desperate of comedy. Maybe the secret of Winky's appeal has been lost in the mists of time. After all, it is now over 92 years since this film had audiences rolling in the aisles. Or maybe the secret of Winky's success has just been lost. Catalogued in the British Film Institute are 33 films that have been tragically mislaid, but include the could-have-been classics Winky Diddles the Hawker, Winky Gets Puffed Up, Winky Bigamist, and Winky Waggles the Wicked Widow. But even such a prolific star as Winky could only wink in one film at a time. Banforth are interesting in their, their later period for how they develop a company of actors. This was a perfectly sensible thing to do. Many other film companies would do so. And you will often see in these films, someone who's a star in one film is the servant girl in, in, in the next. Well, I think every company did that. They had their troupe of players simply because if you were making two films a week and you wanted to make, say, 100 a year, you couldn't have time to stop and hire more people. You hired extras, but your main um, actors, you, you, you needed. What we're doing today, boss? Today, it's Winky and the Gorgonzola cheese. Uh, what about us? For you lot, I've written a groundbreaking comedy based on the new groundbreaking phenomenon called phrenology. Phrenology is the science of determining character by examining lumps on the cranium or head. Who wants to star in it then? Well, I don't. I'll do it. To star in cinema's first ever phrenology film, Mr. Edwin Bamforth chose not Winky, but Mr. Alf Foy. Alf Foy is a very British comedian. He sticks his bottom out and he walks pigeon-toed. And although the scenario is very different to the Winky films, I think they're actually more interesting, particularly the phrenology film. Finding His Counterpart is a, an interesting film. It's quite a find. It's a, a very peculiar little comedy and uh, really quite funny. Over the course of this nine-minute film, our hero desperately tries to use phrenology to find his perfect partner. The pretty young lady whom phrenology might suggest would be Mr. Foy's ideal mate? Well, it's not her. The ladies by the lake, who actually are most definitely men in disguise, it's not them. And what about this handsome beast? Wrong again. As a last resort, he turns to the suffragettes, still a contentious group and a source of much contemporary hilarity. It's not them either. No, viewers, your eyes are not deceiving you. The suffragettes were so annoyed at being manhandled that they plant a bomb under our hero that blows him into an entirely different world, where his attempts to feel up a cannibal prove rather misguided. The film is a completely zany film, which actually works. Ending up with him being eaten by a cannibal, who, who obviously is his perfect partner. With the startling debut of Alf Foy, the battle to be crowned Bamforth's number one comedy clown was on. Winky responded to the threat by making a rather radical decision. He decided to get a job in an office. In Winky's Weekend, Winky abandons his tramp character and debuts his new character, a married office worker. Here he responds to his wife's request to clean the chimney by rather bizarrely stealing some chickens. Winky's Weekend is a very strange film where, for some reason, and I don't know why, in order to clean his chimney, he sticks chickens up it. Now, maybe you can tell me why he would do such a thing, because it doesn't make sense to me. Winky had responded to the competition by abandoning his tramp and introducing comedy chickens. Alf Foy decided to counter by taking his comedy into stranger territory. This is Mystic Glove. Here, Alf Foy goes to an all-you-can-eat restaurant and eats all he can eat. He gets so fat that he has a really bad dream, featuring a really bad ghost, who gives him a magic glove, enabling him to have all sorts of hilarious adventures 
in the park. Comedies of the teens do have this very peculiar surrealistic element to them. This was a, a thing that clearly delighted people about cinema, that you could create these really wacky scenes, you know, using various camera tricks. And there are some really very bizarre comedies. And um, they were delightful. As Winky and Alf Foy engaged in battle, war broke out. No, war broke out. That's right, the First World War had kicked off. Bamforths responded to the serious situation Britain found itself in with the release of Sharps and Flats. In this 20-minute film, Winky once again plays another office worker, this time called Mr. Brown. Following the outbreak of hostilities, Mr. Brown leaves his wife to attend military training. Actually, he doesn't. Instead of doing his patriotic duty, Mr. Brown decides to run off with a friend to chase floozies in the countryside while sending telegrams home to their wives full of double entendres about their company being under canvas and a particular favourite of mine about how good the tarts taste on their lips. This celebration of infidelity and draft dodging was something of an odd response to the horrors of the Great War but it was actually one of Bamforth's most advanced movies to date. The later Bamforth films are sadly little known by film historians, so they really are deserving of, 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 of rediscovery. You look at the films they're making, uh, subtle little uh, social comedies, nice little bits of comic business, and, and quite sharp so social themes when you look at a film like Sharps and Flats, where, where it's about people trying to evade the draft. There was just a, a distinctive atmosphere to the Banffor films of that period, which you don't quite see in other films of the, of the period. A kind of English social comedy that seems to be unique to, 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 to Banffor. Sadly, after starring in 50-odd films, and just as he was earning some critical plaudits, Sharps and Flats marked the end of Winky. We're not entirely sure what happened to him, but one story has Winky, real name Reggie Switz, falling victim to a case of mistaken identity. We're not quite sure what happened, but we suspect that when the war broke out, because his name was Switz, audiences might believe that he was German. He wasn't, he was British, but the name was perhaps rather against him and perhaps the company thought that this would mean that audiences wouldn't go and see his films. We're not really sure, but if that is the case, that is a very sad story indeed. But before you despair at the loss of Homeforth's silent superstar, there is another theory. And that is that Bamforth's top screen actress, Lily Ward, was so taken with Winky that she left her husband. Coincidentally, another Bamforth comedy clown, seen here with his wife. Rumour has it that Lily and Winky absconded to Australia. But whatever happened, Winky's time at the top may have always been short-lived. War meant things were changing. The business is changing. Films are starting to get longer. The great Italian epics like Cabiria and Caius Julius Caesar are coming through for films who were literally with casts of thousands. You had the whole rental system in place. You had big companies, the French and American and Italian companies were in Britain. It was a very different market. Unfortunately, a lot of filmmakers didn't keep up with the modern techniques. If you see a Bamford film and then look at an American or French film from 1912, the Bamford film looks like it was made in 1900. I've heard people saying our films are a tad old-fashioned. Oh no, brother. Our films are super modern. Mm, even so, I think we need to move with the times. And these are the times for Jesse. Jesse is unlike any of the other films that Bamforth's made. I think it's a, it's a drama, a melodrama, in fact, you might call it today. It's uh, of a very uh, sombre nature indeed. It's difficult for us today, I think, to appreciate just what a part of um, life, death, was. 
It's it's part of the way that, that it's portrayed in the films, of course, is very much part of the Victorian legacy of the sentimentalising and romanticising of it, and that was their way of dealing with it. In this epic 20-minute melodrama, Jessie, the younger sister Winnie is found in the street by a kindly neighbour, Mrs Clear, who offers to adopt her. Older sister Jessie can't support Winnie and so makes the unwilling sacrifice by signing Winnie over to Mrs Clear. Winnie is looking at a brighter future, but it doesn't make Jessie any the happier. Determined to turn her life around, Jessie tries to find employment. But she doesn't get any. But she does get herself a stalker. Jessie then spends her last shilling on some tat to sell, but other tat sellers reject her. Exhausted, she sells tat alone and falls into the arms of the stalker, whereupon they fall in love and decide to marry. Jessie tells the stalker fiancé the situation, and he comes up with a plan. Jessie sends a note to Mrs Clear asking for Winnie back, but Mrs Clear says, no, an agreement is an agreement. I love your sister too dearly to part with her. Jessie is devastated, but the stalker fiancé tries to make her feel better with a walk in the country and a visit to his stepmother and his stepmother's newly adopted child, who, in an epic twist, turns out to be none other than Winnie. I guess that Bamfus were experimenting with another genre that was popular in the marketplace at that time and seeing whether or not this was an area that they would like to explore further in their filmmaking. There were quite a few of these uh, melodramatic subjects around at the time and they were clearly popular uh, but it does seem to be a fairly radical departure from the other films that Bamfus had made previously. Bamforths made one final film. It was their only full-length feature, a melodrama entitled Paula. Tragically for film lovers, all that remains of Paula are these four rather dark photographs. Rumour has it that there was an order from Russia for 100 Bamforth films, but that order would go unfulfilled. In 1915, the Bamforths of Homeforth left the filmmaking business forever. The finish of the filming days seemed to be caused by, in the First World War, a lack of silver content for the films. I think the story that they stopped film production because they couldn't get hold of enough nitrate film stock because it was being used for munitions is myth, an excuse or whatever. That's, essentially, they couldn't sell the films. With the First World War, markets disappeared, certainly the European market. Distribution was difficult, and unless you were one of the big, confident companies, you were very unlikely to, to, to last many months in, in, into the war. I think they timed their move from shorts to features at a bad time, and they weren't the only company to go out of business because the war was on. And when enlistment started, I think it was in January 1916, all men of fighting age had to go to the front. And I think that killed an awful lot of film, film produ pr uh, production. Oh, come on, sister. Enough of this doom and gloom. We may no longer be film producers, but that doesn't mean the end of Bamforths. It doesn't? Film's overrated, anyhow. Let's become the biggest postcard business in the world. Yes, let's. Edwin Bamforth's decision was perhaps a wise one. During the war, the song cards were a triumph, making Bamforths indeed the biggest postcard manufacturers in the world. And by the middle of the century, the transformation from James Bamforth temperance lantern slides was complete, as Bamforths became synonymous with the saucy seaside postcard and responsible for several hundred million of them over the years. It is perhaps a shame that Bamforths didn't continue to make films, but you have to look at Bamforths in their wider business context. Films were a commercial product. This is not high art that we're talking about. And if they could not pay their way, then they wouldn't be part of that business. In actual fact, the motion films um, were quite a thing, but on the other hand, I remember my father used to say that um, 
we probably lost money on the whole thing. But it was a shame that the uh, First World War stopped it. I think it would have progressed and progressed quite well. So should Bamforths really be credited as film giants? Sadly, we may never know, and for that you could blame the Bamforths themselves. I think the original films, we had pretty well the whole of them in the works at Station Road. But unfortunately, during the war years, heating became difficult, I suppose, and they probably didn't have it on at weekends and that sort of thing. And the films stuck. To, um, and there were only um, a small percentage were possible to utilize. It is a regret because if we had 125 films to show, instead of probably just 25, it would have been um, a wonderful thing. All we know of over a hundred of Bamforth's missing works are their titles. Films like Papa's Little Weakness, Peppering His Own Porridge, Venus and the Nuts, and Tommy's Freezing Spray remain enigmas. And we may never know how good Who's Witch, Oh My, or even What The may have been. We don't know, are we seeing the very best of the Banffles films, of the ones that survive? But I think it's the case that people today would enjoy seeing the Banffles films. And in terms of do they match what else was happening elsewhere in cinema production at the time, I think the answer is yes, they do. You're looking at a really important part of British popular culture that should be better known, both nationally and I think internationally. Unless someone finds a load of old films in their attic, we may never appreciate Banforth's true worth. But even if these lost films turn out to be classics of the first order, could Holmfirth really have laughed in the face of Hollywood and been the movie-making capital of the world? Holmfirth in the Pennines is about the worst possible place for the sunshine. And the sunshine is necessary for outdoor shops. And Hollywood has sunshine every day of the week. So it is a slight disadvantage. Home Firth has its own microclimate and there would be many filmmaking days that would be lost because of more grime descended on the town and uh, made it very difficult. Why didn't the film industry develop in Britain? Why did it go to America? This is a very, very complicated question. The weather has a lot to do with it and possibly if you had to pick out one reason why Home Firth didn't become Hollywood, Probably the weather would be it. So there you have it. My plan to turn Holmfirth into Hollywood was scuppered by the good old British weather. But Holmfirth itself never did give up the ghost. Yes, that's right, viewers. Despite my descendants selling off the company, Holmfirth has yet to turn its back on the tradition which I first began. For 30 years now, it's been home to the world's longest-running sitcom, The Last of the Summer Wine. Just imagine, if it wasn't for all that rain, you could have had twice as many episodes. Thank God for Hollywood. Yeah.